Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I'm doing very well. What is this, episode 13? 12. Episode 12. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. You, that's, a, that's a classic off-by-one error. I'm doing well over here. I'm excited for the show today. I don't. Th- I don't think I have anything else here before we dive in. Uh, I mean, I. I do have. I had. I do have one of the the follow ups from last week. Your your little pseudo code jab. I was about to put like seventy two reasons why Python is not pseudo code. Just I, I didn't mean anything bad by it. <laughs> but I did. I did happen across this article this week. Python is not pseudo code, and and here to prove it is uh, Miguel Burrito. I uh, had a really good article about mastering Python's f strings, and. Anyone who knows the history of Python knows that it's it's been uh, historically correct or Pythonic to use the percentage sign operator to format strings. Like that's that's the way we've been formatting strings since Python basically came out. More recently, they introduced the dot format notation um, to more accurately handle. Uh, ways to to format code, you know, in, incorporating curly braces in inside of strings. Lately, and and this is something that's actually relatively new to me, uh, is including f strings in this, which is uh, actually formatting strings in line. So it looks a lot cleaner and it it's a lot more readable, I think, than the dot format notation. But you can just do like so much stuff with that. I had I had no clue uh, all the things you could you could put put in here. Um, just you could you could actually run like expressions in here, like um, multiplications or additions of of integers in here. Uh, you can call functions from inside of one of those. Yeah. Speaking to something as simple as you know how how do you format a string has has really undergone a lot of thought. People have really taken this personally and said there's so much we could do with this. Um, let's make sure we get it right. Um, I know this this type of thing helps me a lot because when I'm trying to understand you know how do I use something, I'm I need to know what what are the boundaries that I'm reaching against. You know what are what are some examples. You know what is not supposed to be done in that and and this just really really comes at it from all angles what do you say 72 72 ways he had there and he just lists list them off there 73 examples yeah yeah the one i pulled up there was uh uh debugging code and that mm-hmm. it looks immensely helpful so you can print out what the uh function is doing and kind of just walking through uh your code you can print out what the methods are saying yep we also use uh, in in Ansible the Jinja notation for string variables, yeah. which is a double curly brace. Um, so yeah. Python's formatting having a single curly brace, it is actually very hard to print a curly brace using Python because curly brace is the notation for a variable. So actually, what you end up having yeah. to do, and I don't know if he he notes it in here, but to actually print out a literal curly brace, you have to double up curly braces. It's not a forward slash. That's, that's initially what I thought uh, when I was putting some like of the stuff together. Character, yeah, yeah, exactly. But you actually double up the curly brace to print one literal curly brace. So there is code in in our playbooks repo in one of our Python scripts that actually has four curly braces in a row because you need to print two literal curly braces. It oh looks gosh. really weird, but it works perfectly. So tons of intricacies here with Python's string formatting and. Uh, I, I, I just, you know, hats off, uh, figuratively to the author here, just doing such a good job at, at, at going over the, and showing why Python is not in fact pseudocode. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of news items here. And the, the first one is that Git T was released, uh, or, well, a version of Git T I was gonna say it's not the first release here we're at. <laughs> no, it's not, and and actually this is a very strong project. Uh, Git T, uh, if if anyone is unaware, is a self-hosted clone of GitHub, or, or you know you can host Git repos on there. The frustrating part is that they host all of their code on GitHub rather than their own Git T instance. There is a a open 
bug report there for them to migrate onto their own instance, but it's been open for like a year and a half. So I don't know if that's ongoing or, or what. Um, and actually, you know what, that, that does speak to something I believe in before we dive into this, the rest of this, but like, I, I absolutely believe in dog fooding anything that you're going to be producing for anyone else. I mean, yeah. that's paramount, honestly, to, to anything that you're going to put out there, right? If you're not using the product, then how, how do you even know, you know, how, how feedback's going? Like, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I, I understand if you're putting something out there that isn't necessarily your, your forte, but for a lot of open source projects, I mean, they get started because you're filling, you, you know, you're, you're, you're solving a problem for yourself and then you go forward. Yeah, I mean, right. that's, that's how this came to be. That's how almost all open source, uh, ends up, ends up starting, right? Maybe not. That's where it gets to, but like Git itself was just solving a problem that, that Linus had in, in tracking the, the version control of the Linux kernel. Either way, I, I I've, I've heard nothing but good things about the actual product. Yeah, I was looking at self-hosted instances of GitLab, and it's heavy. It's beefy. Yeah, and Git is like a, a pretty simple Docker image that you just kind of deploy out there and just connect to a database. I'm like, oh, well, I got to check this out. Prioritizing stuff is difficult. I mean, it really is. You know, and, and if, especially yeah. if we don't have a need and we already have... The tools available out there. Yeah, the, the, we're, we're using other things to solve that problem. Right. We don't necessarily have that problem right now, right? Maybe in the right. future we will, but but right now we don't. Git T had an implementation that they added to their product, um, which is implementing Kanban boards. They're the latest in a series of trends where project after project after project that we see implementing Kanban boards in order to track states of work or, or effort or prioritization or what have you, product after product after product is switching over to this kind of visual representation of, of whatever it is. Uh, for for them, I would assume this has to do mainly with, with issues. Issue tracker, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and that's that's what it looks like here with different tags and and categories i haven't gone through all of the implementation details or, or really had a chance to try this out but i just kind of wanted to pull attention that once again more and more people are finding that kanban boards are a really good way to visualize work and to and to manage work right and to manage yeah, collaboration absolutely. among teams or, or or just personal projects i wanted to to reinforce obviously this this episode is going to be strong in the the kanban vein of things reinforcing why we're doing this uh, because I, I think it is important and i see it over and over and over again in the broader community the next news item here that i had was that reddit reveals their daily active user count for the first time which was interesting to me that first of all that they had never done that before second of all yeah. that they had 52 million daily users. Now that is as opposed to Twitter with 187 million and Facebook 1.82 billion. Now Reddit, interestingly enough, shows that year over year they're growing at about 44%, whereas wow. Twitter uh, is at 29% and Facebook at 12% growth. Sure. So... These are all obviously social media networks which rely on viral engines of growth. So their growth rate is very, very important to them. And we see Reddit is topping that chart by 15% over the, the next largest, which is, which is Twitter, um, of the large social media networks. Totally. They have a lot of room to grow to 50 million compared to 1.2 billion yeah, that being the case, I wanted to piggyback off of their their network effect, um, and I went ahead and created a subreddit, an R Compose subreddit. So that is now currently up and, and active. By the time this episode goes out, I hope to have some content out there, uh, fleshing Definitely. out some of the wikis and the themes and stuff. Um, and obviously, I think Jack and I would both uh, suggest that you access it via old.reddit.com. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> I am looking into this actually as an alternative to locals. Uh, locals, in a sense, more so is catered to content creators whose sole source of income 
is the the donations or the community around them right we we actually as as having a product uh, are putting this out there just to get a community uh, around what we're doing here yeah to do that i would i would rather create a space that's a little bit more accessible feel free to to access it and uh, i'll put a link in the show notes uh, so that anyone interested in in doing so can check it out and it'll probably be in a lot of our material going forward here any thoughts on that jack i'm excited for it yeah I'm very excited i think it's gonna work well for us i've never never been a mod on any of the subreddits so i'm gonna have to get used really? to like mod okay. tools and stuff like that and, um i mean I've, I've been a moderator other places but i'm not never never on reddit okay okay yeah, we'll have to navigate it. Next news item here. Uh, we have Zero SSL that is starting down the same path that Let's Encrypt did several years ago, where they are being able to produce their certificates in an automated fashion using the ACME protocol. Now, it's called the ACME protocol because it is meant to work with various providers. Up until this point, though, Let's Encrypt was the only p- certificate provider that would implement that protocol yeah so it's like is it really a protocol or is it just their way of accessing their certs yeah right and since zero ssl coming online i think this is reinforcing the fact that it is yes indeed a a protocol yeah rather than just some functionality for them exactly so i'm i'm very 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 happy to see this and obviously competition is great and i don't know if it's necessarily going to drive down price since the certs themselves are free but um i'm very excited to see what zero ssl brings to the table definitely i I like i said it's a good to have competition because honestly it is just let's encrypt out there in terms of i guess the free ssl cert you can go to let's encrypt and i'm sure there are a bunch of other companies that provide it for free but it's so easy to just grab the cert using their uh cert bot and let's encrypt uh, command tools and you just pull it down and it's very easy to set the DNS setting or whatever and have everything there for you. So so it, it is simple. Um, unfortunately, I ran into a bit of an issue with CertBot uh, the other day. Do you want to explain it? Yeah, Cert, CertBot actually deprecated one of the functionalities that uh, the the library that we use uses in order to install CertBot and get it all set up. <laughs> Uh, so that was an, an interesting thing to find out 10:30 at night uh, is that the the upstream uh, broke productions. Um, so we, we, there's a there's a temporary workaround right now, but the functionality that they deprecated on Debian based systems, which our base is Ubuntu, so we would be using that, is the ability to have the installation of Certbot and the registration for the actual cert in one really convenient command. Now, since we're automated a lot of this, that doesn't necessarily take away anything that we're doing. I mean, we can we can automate whatever we need to. Right. Um, it's obviously going to be some more you know development effort to go into that to remediate what they've deprecated. So so the real problem with that though is that they they have their updated recommended way to install Serpot right rather than this this nice self contained script. Uh, and that would actually be to use a snap to install CertBot. Th- that's what they prefer now? They prefer the snap? Yeah, yeah. They they recommend that snap is used to install the hmm. the, the, the CertBot client yeah. uh, that, that implements the Acme protocol. And Ubuntu actually now, and I just kind of found this out, ships with snap pre-installed and pre-configured ready to go. So it's not really a whole lot of overhead. I'm keeping track of this i don't know necessarily what i think uh about it but ubuntu is leaning heavily into the snaps um and unfortunately it seems like a hybrid of everything else like a like a flat pack or an app image yeah mixed in with a handful of not invented here syndrome and it's it's frustratingly complex and not necessarily easy to access or 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 dive into as a systems administrator. Like it, it is not set up at all like I would expect it to be. Yet it can still manage system packages. I'm not a big fan of snaps, just because I feel like you. It's like you said, you kind of lose that observability. I don't know what sure. you want to call it, but 
it installs the package and then you're just kind of it, it works it's there but snap kind of just abstracts it a layer further than i need it yeah it abstracts it and it sandboxes it at the same time it doesn't it, it exposes it non-sandboxed and it's it's really odd especially when we we get to the point where when i'm when i'm upgrading a a system a debian based system with apt right i'm using that and now i also have to go and update all my snaps right i'm i'm now using two packaging utilities when one was working just fine i i i, I don't understand what's going on i don't know i feel like there's there's a lot of innovation going into these kind of alternative package distribution methods when it's kind of been a solved problem for the most part of the past two decades. Now, I mean, there's definitely some cool things to implement, like sandboxing and and having the ability to run concurrent versions and dependency resolution uh, is, is very good with these. So, I mean, there, there are problems that they're actually solving. I'm not sure, though, I would, I would cast them as a recommended route, though, yet. <laughs> right, right. That is the one of the, one of the major features I really like is you can run concurrent versions, but it just mounts to the, the root namespace basically. So it's like everything is slash snap mm-hmm. application. Is that so? I don't know. I, something about that I just don't like. I don't know if that's just me or what, but we'll see how this plays out in the long term. Um, I, I have a feeling it's introducing complexity for complexity's sake. So I'll I'll be watching that see if they can't clean it up a little bit. Definitely. I did have one news item here, and I think I kind of saw it this week. I saw Docker uh, 20.10.0 was released. I didn't see anything too crazy going on here, but uh, Kubernetes actually dropped uh, the Docker runtime. So you either have to move to ContainerD or Cryo, which if you ask me, there's a lot going on. I feel like a lot of it is politics and kind of shaking up Docker. I feel like Docker was first there, market. So it was kind of there, they're in their hands essentially. But uh, was it cloud native is now saying, "Hey, guess what? It's not the uh, Docker show plus everybody else. It's the hey, <laughs> we have a bunch of open source tools here. Why don't we try out uh, everything else?" You hit the nail on the head there. It is it is different tooling, right? And right. the the Docker tool set is a human interface to the underlying container right. software and that is kind of all contained within container d which is a part of the docker stack and and docker is right. that full stack um but the the underlying runtime that docker uses is still supported by kubernetes it's just that overlay tool set is no longer supported i'm, I'm starting to dive into other tools besides docker out there and it's not the build uh that's changing up it's a lot of the runtime stuff a lot of the lower level stuff that's kind of abstracted away but a uh, docker is that pretty terminal application that you have as a lot of what a lot of what it is a lot of what how i see it or use it which it's that full stack but you know maybe you want to get more into uh the intricacies of it and the container runtime so yep thought i'd toss that out there cool uh, well, with that, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into the developments for our Compose now. Definitely. Um, the first one comes to mind is on the first we do all of our migrations, right? So I, I double check to see if there's any uh, new versions to upgrade our defaults to. And besides Portal and Command Center, you know, which we're obviously tracking ourselves um, that, that had gotten bumped up. Um, Bookstack actually went from 0.28.3 to 0.29.3. So um, okay. that is a default upgrade. Uh, and I honestly haven't seen much of a difference. Uh, everything just kind of works, which I is, is that's the reason All right. why we do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> Test it out first, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. The, the other thing that, that went on in the development land here was... Um, something that we had talked about when we were talking about Hugo, someone had switched over their site generation. Yeah, I forget who, but, uh, someone switched over from Jekyll to, uh, Hugo. The latency was almost zero. Why is that? Yeah. Are we running into uh build time, uh, issues here? <laughs> so I was, I was doing migrations, uh, <laughs> a weekend ago or whatever. And 
I I found that some of our deploys were failing, and I had no clue why because everything nothing had changed for for Jekyll on the, on yeah. the Jekyll side. I went through, and and we have a task here that looks for the server uh, actually being up and running uh, before it moves on to the next task to make sure that it can do all the appropriate linking and, and stuff that needs to happen. Sure. And I found out that that wasn't happening. That was actually timing out. So we. we we had it on two minutes, and builds were timing out after two minutes, which is not to be unexpected since there are some peripheral things we're doing at build time. But to to be to be timing out is not good at that point. So I, I bumped it up to six minutes, and that should seems to be just fine. Problem solved. I mean, it's not the greatest kind of <laughs> you know elegant solution. <laughs> Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'd be better sure like parsing the logs and figuring out, but I was just like, you know what? Six just minutes. Fix it. It's fixed for now. If it doesn't, yeah. F- yeah. if it doesn't build in six minutes, then we, we got bigger problems. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> we probably do need to take a look at it at that point. Uh, either way. Uh, I, I, I did find that interesting having just discussed that. Do we want to dive into uh integration discussion here? Yeah. So I think we had discussed at the very beginning of the podcast, how we were going to cover an overview of every application and then start to deep dive into um, the applications we kind of run and support at our compose. And the first one we picked here is Camboard. So we're going to walk through everything in the Camboard. We're going to dive, dive into it here. I think Andrew's going to talk about the application interface and dive into the application. So take us away. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> the meat and potatoes of what I'm going over today is going to be the application interface, how you interface with the application, you know, what are the different screens, what should you be expecting, and 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 how to work with, with Camboard yeah. on a day-to-day basis um, from the interface point of view. Uh, I did look at the deployment configuration page uh, first because that is logically first. We're looking to include a couple of other things in the future, um, some notes here, you know, changing logo, having pre-installed plugins, different themes and default sure. boards. Uh, that's just not something that's implemented right now, though. Uh, the, the initial deployment doesn't have anything necessarily that you need to set up before you run that deploy. So that being said, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into the interface. So there there are a couple of major interfaces that are necessary to operate Camboard. Um, those being the dashboard, the main board view, the new task prompt, the task detail page, uh, and then I wanted to say a couple things about mobile access. So let's let's go ahead and dive into the dashboard. Uh, and and I do have, as as we like to do here, uh, screenshots and graphs. So <laughs> oh, for the podcast, yeah, right. <laughs> as a podcast, I thought that would be more most appropriate. Um, <laughs> The best form of media we can use is pictures and graphs. <laughs> uh, in the documentation, though, it makes perfect sense. There are a couple of different interfaces to get familiar with. Uh, the dashboard one can be considered y- your homepage. By default, it has the list of your projects and the tasks that are assigned to you in those projects. The top section would be just a list of projects that you're involved in. Uh, this would be for easy navigation to one of the other projects, and you can just jump right to it right from your dashboard. You can jump to that board. That'll take you to the main board screen. It'll give you a very, very brief summation of that project from a point of view that you you might care about. But the second part of that is actually the more interesting for me. This is my to-do list. This is where I sit down and I say, what am I doing today? Uh, because this is filtered not by all the tasks I have assigned, because that's like over 200 tasks so that's not going to be any yeah, kind of helpful right. uh this by default will include uh the columns only the columns that are a quote-unquote in progress column given that i can use this as my to-do list because it, it presents me a what is in progress right now listing it's probably the handiest way to get a really quick rundown of what is to come now the the sort option the weird thing about the sort option is I haven't found a way to get it to persist. So like if I tell it to default sort by priority, um, I can get it to sort by priority until I refresh the page. The sort option, if you do find yourself faced with a really long list of things, you know, at least there is the functionality there to initially sort it by something. 
Yeah, yeah. And and a little note here that these tasks should be the ones that you can jump in and work on any time. They should not be waiting on anything. Because once again, you want to use this as your to-do list, your daily, you know, I, I, I can look at this, I can pull up this page at any point in my day and no. say, I've got to spare 5, 10, 20 minutes. What can I jump into real quick? And I can scan the list right. of tasks that are ready for me to do that. The tasks uh, on themselves have details that are roughly equivalent to what is displayed on the task card detail on the board itself. So we're going to dive into the task card detail in a bit. But first, I want to go over the main board view. Uh, so this is this is the typical what people think of when they think of a, a Kanban board, which is a, a board of swim lanes and columns with tasks notes on them. So the, the, the board itself is fairly vanilla in that it has swim lanes, it has columns. Some of the, the things that I found that have been really helpful is collapsing some of those columns and some of the swim lanes. So specifically when I want to focus on what I can be doing at any given time, right? I will collapse a subset of the columns available to me. So I would collapse my backlog column because I don't need to see everything that's in my backlog when I'm looking at something to do right now. I would collapse my waiting column and my pending column and my done column because those are yeah. all states where I can't currently jump in to do something immediately. Yeah, it helps declutter the board is yeah. how I look at it. It's a yeah. it's a big declutter thing. We have backlog that just scrolls for days, basically. And I, closing it out because I don't need to see it and closing out done because I don't need to see it or not covering it. It's exactly what you said. You need to just be able to jump right into it so you can just see what's basically in your in progress. Yeah, and that that is my day-to-day -day view. That's exactly what I need to focus on when I'm sitting down or, well, as my case may be, standing up to do some work. And then for each task on that board, uh, they have a lot of things really crammed into their, their representation on the board. And, and I just went ahead and detailed all these out here. Yeah, the documentation is great. I'd highly recommend checking it out because <laughs> the pictures are, are great and everything is clearly documented. Obviously, it's a little bit hard to go over on the podcast, but we can at least provide the content that's there. And yeah, I, 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 tried to, I tried to choose one of my busiest tasks to just to run it down in, in no particular order. It has its number, its title, its assignee. It has its category, its due date, its complexity. Uh, it has the comments, the subtasks, the reoccurrence, uh, the duration, and the priority. So all of this, all of this is represented clearly and effectively on the task. So, you know, hats off to the, the creators of, of Camboard maintainers because they, they do do a great job at differentiating stuff. For instance, the, the due date has a little calendar by it. Uh, it also changes color to red when it's past the due date. The priority in the subtasks and the comments all have little icons next to them which indicate uh, what they are, and, and they will always show up in the same place too. Um, now, the cool thing about this, and I might add it to the documentation, but... A lot of those things are clickable inside of the task. Obviously, the task gets clicked and dragged, you know, between columns, sure. between states and swim lanes. But the the actual representations of the things on the columns can be clicked. For instance, if you click the comments, the little comment bubble um, or the number of, of how many comments there are, that will actually pop up the comment dialog where you can you can add a comment or look at the previous comments without having to go into that actual task detail. Uh, the same thing with the subtasks. And even there's a little edit button right next to the assignee name. And you can actually bring that up and edit stuff in the task like the category or the assignee or anything else, like I said, without having to dive into the task detail page. So I think it's it's really handy uh, as a as a high level overview where you need to you need to sit down and you're like, all right, I need to manage what I'm doing. If you have a quick question about, you know, what was the last comment on this? I can bring that up fairly quickly without losing my place on the board. Right. It's right in front of you. And that board, the, it's a good thing you mentioned. This, so this is just on the main board view. Is uh, basically where I'd go with it, and there's a lot, a lot of information just condensed in there. It's really easy to see without diving into the task detail. 
all the information you might you know need to know about about the task well and and one of my favorite things that i've been starting to pay more and more attention to is the duration field so there's there's actually two numbers in the duration field it's the duration since it was created and the duration that it's been in the column that it's in so you can see how long ago did i you know come up with this idea versus how long has this been sitting here or how long has this been waiting something like that i'm actually just going to Keep steamrolling forward here and uh, take a look at you know what it what it takes to create a new task. So there are a couple ways to create a new task. My typical way of doing it is next to every column name um, on every swim lane is a little plus sign that will pop up a, a way to create yeah. a new task. Yeah. However, in almost all of the the pages here on the top left, there's a gear icon that will drop down. And you can create a brand new task using that dropdown. If you use the gear icon on the top left, it will try to default, I think, to the very top left of the board. So in this case, it would be the backlog in emergency. But either way you go about doing it, you're going to have a a new task prompt with just a whole bunch of fields to fill out. A lot of information in there, uh, but I'd even say a lot of it is optional. The only thing that's required is the title of the task. Now, everything can be changed after the task is created, so there's no need to actually worry about getting this right the first try. Uh, nothing is nothing is permanent, and, and the rest of it can be filled in later if necessary if you just don't have that information. Um, I, Jack and I change the titles of our tasks all the time based on scope creep and, and whether we need to redefine what what's actually going on with with what we needed it to be there, there are things on here i believe though that are more important than others so for instance the title obviously is very important uh the description as well sure. is something and, and we went over this when we were talking about the Pretty. overview as to like what yeah. needs to go into the description we need you know why are we creating this task you know what does this task look like when it's going to be done and you know how should we approach um, implementing this this fix or, or 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 working this task, yeah. So having that in the title and description is a very very good first step. Um, a couple other things that I usually pay attention to: uh, the assignee obviously is going to be a key one. If you're using just a personal board, I mean that's going to be a no brainer. But if you're on a team or, or working with someone else, then yeah, you're going to want to make sure that that assignee gets populated. So I even have a comment on a personal board. I, I t- even tend to uh, assign myself on the personal board just because if I don't assign it, sometimes it won't show up in that main page and I won't see the task or I don't – It it's a weird kind of – it's it's unassigned and I'm the only person on that board, but it's something I guess I've just kind of ingrained in myself now to automatically assign it to me for just for visibility and so I can see it, I guess. You can actually set the swim lane and column in here. So if it defaults to the emergency backlog, like it does if you you choose it from the main page, you can change that there. The category obviously is going to be what you set up on your board. And I'm not going to dive into what categories need to be right now. I I think we kind of touched that back in the first cam board episode. There, there are a couple different ways to set up categories, uh, but this presents a drop down here, which is super nice. So I don't have to keep those all in my head and remember them. The only other two things that I really play around with a lot on this new task page are due date and complexity. I, I was going to say, I love, I, I, I will add complexity to all the tasks just so I'm like, well, this is, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not diving into something that I thought was going to take five minutes is now taking three hours. I, I at least can. Yeah kind of brace brace myself for the the time i'm gonna spend yeah absolutely uh and then the other thing here to touch on would be the due date field if it's unset it will show the current time if you set the due date and then need to unset it it is actually as simple as deleting that entire field like you would just highlight everything like you would highlight a block of text and just backspace it right out and, and usually I don't set due dates unless I do have a hard due date. Uh, that's more of a philosophical discussion. Um, but if if you're someone who, who likes to have arbitrary due dates or like I would I would much rather have it by this time, um, that also does allow it to be set up on the calendar too. So if you're more of a calendar person, you want everything on there, um, you can make the due date whatever you want it to be. You can make it the day that I want to you know have this 
either done by or the day that this is happening. Uh, keep in mind, there is also the start date, uh, which will also show up on your calendar. So if you need it to, to remind you to start something or that you're currently working on that, you can set the start date and the due date separately. Jack, what do you feel about tags? So there is a gray area for me between categories and tags. I'd say categories are, I would even put it as a project, like an overarching project or I guess a group. And I guess tags would be a subset of the category almost. So we have infrastructure as an example, uh, you know, versus business versus tooling versus I forget what the sales out there. And so that's, you know, fine. That's the category. I, I'd go further with the tags and just break it down even more. Um, so a lot of the tags I use are for like uh, command center. I'll use as a tag like, hey, this is part of the command center app or, hey, this is part of the portal application. and um, it can stretch across categories. So like tooling we have, so I had to set up CI CD for both command center and portal. I'd say, uh, I tagged it portal, but it was part of tooling, uh, infrastructure it's out there. Uh, I didn't really have to, I don't, I don't think I had anything in the infrastructure category, but essentially I would tag it portal and say, Hey, well, we need to deploy this on a new instance or, you know, application it's tagged portal or command center. That's a lot of what I use tags for i don't know what are your thoughts on them the best breakdown i've heard is to use categories as almost like a who am i representing at this point because obviously as a small business here we have to wear a lot of different hats you know, right. we have to wear the business hat we have to wear the technical architect hat you know we we've the sales hat we we've got a lot of different things that we need to wear right and the mindset that I need to be in to do that in Hask is the category I typically will, will place it in. That's why we have different stuff for the podcast, different stuff for the business, different, you know. So so we, we, we kind of separate those out. Whereas if we were to, you know, thinking way down the road, if we were to be looking to build out the company, we would have the different sections and could start to identify, you know, what really needs to to get focused on. I thought that was a great overview of the categories. What would you say for the tags? The tags are going to be any anything that's a subset of that. Like, honestly, it's okay. I, I started okay. out using okay. it for uh, like version numbers. I was like, you know, it, let me let me tag this as a 2.0 when we were working towards that. And I say this is required to get to a yeah. 2.0 state. Um, and then I would also tag it with like the uh, application name. So like. So I have a I have a category of, of services when I'm working on adding new services or fixing stuff in services, and I would tag something as a blog if it was one of the blog generators. Like so, in my backlog, in the services category, I've got Hugo, I've got WordPress, I've got you know there there are different subsections of services uh and then also if i have like a specifically jekyll fix to do something right um i will i will actually put jekyll in the in the tag as the actual specifically yeah. application it can be used for for so many different things it's i call tags very loose i i, I think what you want to avoid doing is is making that any kind of rigid tags need to be yeah tags need to be very fluid and they need to be organic uh, and I, I the the real benefit there is that when you when you start doing reporting then you can start looking at tags and saying do i see a trend in these tags and you have to let something organically develop from the tags whereas the categories right. need to be up front and figured out first and, and this does give a, a bit of autonomy to people too because so they can experiment with different ways to, to tag things and you can also go back and tag things retroactively if you need to so it's it's not that big of a deal if you you know quote unquote mess up but i think i think the most important thing here is that this needs to be this tag field needs to be organic and also i'd say avoid the spray because you can just spray everything with tags because if you have a bunch of tags out there just so you have a bunch of tasks and then you just spray them with tags. I, I guess you could kind of correlate them all together for boards. Like the one you and I are working on or my own personal board. Yeah. That, that spray is just going to get annoying and it's going to yeah, be a right. restriction <laughs> that I impose on myself and then I'm not going to follow it. So then no one on the board is following it. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. It's out there. Right. So at, at that point, and I say organic, but I, I, I mean that you have to be a little bit more, 
a little bit thoughtful, right, in in how you put it in. You you can't just spray it. Yeah, that's what I was getting at. That's what I was getting at. It's got to be or it's organic, but you can't just. All right. Well, let's toss everything, every single keyword I can think of on this right now. Yeah. It's exactly. Just... Exactly. That's not going <laughs> to help anybody. Yeah. Right. Right. You're, you're you're sitting through like filtering out tags. Like, oh wait, this does this. This does this. I need you know. I don't know if there's any kind of rule for this, but I usually do one to two tags. If it if it fits, it fits. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I'm not sitting there, you know, tagging every task with fifty tag. 50 tags or whatever but yeah if if it's helpful right and and it may not be helpful in which case don't worry about it like it's right for it's an option for me i i'd say i'd say it's much more important to get your categories right and to get it so that it it benefits uh your workflow especially if you're prioritizing you say hey i want to work on some of the business stuff this week i can go into my categories i can start filtering by by my business category and saying hey these are the things that i've identified that i need to prioritize now so that that makes it easy for me without having to worry about necessarily the the tagging until I get to the point where that's something that I I think is going to benefit me in the long run. And then speaking of tasks, you know, just diving into the the task detail page, and this is this is where you go after you create a task. Uh, this is this is the representation of the task. This is where you can do everything in in the task, and where you can change anything in that task that you had set up previously. I love, I actually love Canboard's um, implementation of the task detail page uh, as compared to Jira or honestly, I've used only Jira and Canboard as boards. I haven't, I haven't touched or messed with deck at all in Nextcloud. What about Trello? Uh, I've used it a little bit, not, not extensively. Uh, I've been in it, I've touched it, but, past creating you know a title and a description and moving it across the board i haven't really messed with the comments features and i can't really talk on it but i love canboard's task detail page and yeah, all I, the information I, that it provides uh you know it's it's yeah it's it's very well laid out uh i i always get the feeling of uh power like i i feel like it's very powerful like it's it's very straightforward easy to use and and can really do everything that i need it to and it's simple too it's yeah. not you're not lost in buttons and widgets and this and that and it's everything's right there yeah so and and just to dive in here there there are a couple of of major things that i use probably more than others you know just to just to highlight those so the the test detail page is the the page that i have whenever i'm working on the task itself i usually have it up i have it in a new browser window just because that's the way i like to to organize stuff absolutely um i like to have you know my one task um and my one task dictates everything that's inside of that window should be related to that one task Um, so this this task detail page gives me access to all my notes links and any other details about the tasks that i've collected so far Uh, now the the middle part of it is all the representation and all the interactive bits of it. I'm actually going to skip most of that and and hop right over into the left hand side column, because that's where the real power functionality sits. So there there are many different actions on the left hand side that you can perform. Um, to to run through the ones I use most of the time, the first one is is edit the task, uh, and that allows me to go back into that new task prompt page view that I was just at when I created the task and I can change any of the details there. So I can change the category. I can change the title. I can change the description, anything in there. That's where I would go to change those things that I set up at the very beginning when I created the task. The next thing is adding a subtask. And I know we haven't necessarily talked about subtasks. I think they are very, very handy, not necessarily to track, uh, separate individual pieces of work but uh like if i need to be reminded about something or if i have a i'll get to that later kind of approach to something inside of that task i'll jot it down as a subtask Uh, yeah i think the great example for subtasks that we have is uh the show everything that goes on with the show and the post editing it's one task that says hey we need to you know deploy the show but it's more it's very easy to say deploy the show and then leave it at that but there's like eight things that ha- that need to happen for us to deploy the show and having those as subtasks i think is a great example yeah and and i think that works perfectly uh, now besides editing the task and adding a subtask there are a couple more things that i 
used day in and day out on this task detail page. That would be uh, adding an external link, uh, just going sequentially down the left-hand side column there. Uh, this allows me to grab anything outside, any kind of blog post, any kind of Wikipedia entry, whatever I need that is going to relate to this page and help me you know, figure out or, or yeah. if I found something, I will make sure to link it in the external link fields. The next one right below that is adding a comment. And it's really easy to paste a link into a comment as well. Now, if you have 50 or 60 comments, it may be pretty hard to wade through that, whereas the external links are just sitting there right at the top. Uh, makes that a little bit more convenient if that's something that you, you, you know, you're concerned about. Otherwise, uh, you know, and, and this is, this is a fight I have with myself too. It's like, I, I, I could do it the quote unquote correct way, which is to add an external link. But sometimes, man, I'm yeah. just in a rush and just toss it in there. It's like it, it, it doesn't hurt anything, right? The functionality yeah. is there only if it helps you. You don't need to use this if it doesn't help you. Yeah, right, right. I love external links, especially for uh, a lot of what we do is, you know, GitLab based. So it's, yeah. you know, hey, look at this PR, look at this, review this code. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with using the comments, you know, linking via comments, but I, I love the external link. It's got its own section. You don't have to dig through the comments to find out what link you need. It's at the top of the page. Yep, exactly. Adding a comment the very first time, you need to actually hit the add a comment button. Um, and then any other time you're going to see at the very bottom of the page, it's just going to be a text box that you can just start typing in and click, yeah. you know, add or whatever. And, and that'll, that'll save your comment. So that's, that's really convenient as you go through these tasks and create, you know, keep creating comment after comment. Uh, but the very first one you do actually have to click that add a comment button. And then the last one that I wanted to point out here is move position. So this is actually a way from inside of the detail page that you can simulate dragging and dropping the task around the board. So you can actually move the swim lanes from you know one to the other, or you can move column states from one to the other uh, using this move position uh, detail page. And that will that will pop up the prompt where you can you can then move it. And, and to piggyback off of that, I find that uh, super helpful when I'm on mobile to get to my last section here. So specifically for that, um, mobile doesn't support the drag and drop functionality from within the, the main board page. So it, okay. you can navigate around the board, but you can't drag and drop from there. Um, so what you would do if, if you need to to change the state of a task, you'd actually go into that task and then select that, that move position and then use that to actually move the position of the board. And, and this is really one of the main points I wanted to make about mobile. Only use mobile to work on a specific task. Do not use it as your resource to organize your board. Yeah. It's unfit to do so. Um, and, and that's why I, I stress that when you need to jump into something, use your dashboard. Right, because the dashboard is a is a great page on mobile, and it'll take you exactly to the task that you need to do on mobile, and then you can make comments and you can do whatever you want uh, on on there. Right, I wouldn't use it to manage your board. Like I say in the documentation here, this isn't just a rip on the software. Any type of board system is meant to be managed with a significant amount of space to work with, and requires enough viewing area to make out the details that are crammed into each of those task cards, and the flexibility that a point-click drag system can afford. You can use the interface to navigate around a project board like I was talking about before, yeah. but I would not recommend using it as your primary means to curating the overall board, right? So when using mobile, you're best served by keeping to your dashboard and specific task cards themselves. Totally agree. This doesn't preclude you from creating new tasks or going in and adding comments uh, to, to old tasks. Actually, this is probably my favorite note system because if if I have a, a, a task doing something and, and I want to take notes on it, it's as easy as you know pulling up a, a card and, and adding a comment right, you got right it. on there. Okay. Yeah, it's it's super simple. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't use it to like say sit down in the morning and say all right, let me drag this over here and that over there and this over you know. Sure. Doesn't right. work like that. Just just doesn't work like that. The, the other point I wanted to make is that on the task detail page, the comment section is still part of the main section, which is displayed first. 
So if you have a lot of comments, you're going to have to scroll all the way down. You're going to have to fling and, and, and get to the very <laughs> bottom of the page scrolling, yeah. in order to get to any of the actions, like adding an external link or, or moving the position. It's going to be all the way at the bottom. It's not going to be on the side like it is on the desktop. Um, but it, it is there. Like all, all the functionality is there and available to you. Uh, it's just in a mobile layout. And I, from what I understand, there that was a conscious decision to make it a mobile web page. The web page is going to be the most supported um, on mobile. Anything, anything else to add? I think I said earlier that this interface is powerful. And it, it takes a couple things to be powerful. One, you have to have a lot of options available to you. And two, they have to be easily understood or and and accessible right and and having canboard being coded in php and not having a lot of fancy css or javascript on top of it it is fairly straightforward that's what i like about it yeah it's it's what we've all kind of come to understand is what is a text field you know what is a button there's no kinds of surprises here everything is laid out and and represented exactly how it should be and and that makes the user experience it it may not be the prettiest right but the user experience is spot on that one word description powerful love it well um speaking about powerful some kind of segue. <laughs> no, I, at this point, I'll, Jack, I'll go ahead and, and turn this over to you. Um, I, I think we, we covered everything that we needed to in, in Camboard today. Uh, okay. And then we, we, we will continue on uh, down this road. I think I think this is a good plan to, to keep keep going on it. Yeah. Hopefully we can kind of keep these in, in, in the forefront of our minds here so that we can keep going back and referencing more of this stuff as we go forward on this. Um, but yeah, we, if if uh, Jack, you wanna you wanna introduce your grab bag discussion and, and give us an overview here. Yeah, I absolutely uh, thank you. Um, basically, yeah, I think we should be uh, renaming grab bag to book report. <laughs> Two weeks in a row now, we've got books here, <laughs> and I think we've done a, a couple books in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this week <laughs> this week's grab bag is uh, permission marketing. It's uh, turning strangers into friends and friends into customers. It's a book by Seth Godin. Basically read the book. It's about marketing. Uh, just getting started. Obviously, every book has an introduction. Um, just, you know, giving the overview. But I really liked it. It was actually an intro that was captivating. <laughs> Most intros are, this is what we're going to cover. This is what we're going to talk about. This, is a, this guy was pretty good. He, he got my attention. Is, is what I'm getting at. He hooked me, per se. A couple of things he said uh, that I really liked. He said, in this book, I'd like to challenge your preconceived notions about what marketing and advertising is and should be and put it back together in a way that works in our new networked world. The concepts are pretty simple, but they are by no means obvious. This one really got me. He said, you're not paying attention. Nobody is. It's not your fault. It's impossible for you to pay attention to everything the markets expect you to. I guess jumping in from here, he talks about two kinds of marketing now he talks about interruption based and permission based the great example of interruption based marketing is uh what you see as advertisements now they're just trying to grab your attention they're trying to get a hold of you they're trying you know their billboards tv advertisements you know radio uh, ads just trying to grab you just trying to grab you and i think everyone just uh, kind of turned into not paying attention because we're so used to seeing these ads. We just blow past them. We don't want them. Yeah, that's that's a conversation I've been having with myself for a long while. I'm like, you know, what can we do to get the words out that's that's not traditional advertising? Because I I don't listen to traditional advertising. I don't know anyone who does or or even thinks highly of it. My roommate constantly is denying the efficacy of advertising, you know, in in general, yeah. and I can't yeah. necessarily argue with him. Uh there's no room. I got a, a a nice bullet point, but everyone's I think everyone's just so used to seeing these ads, it's just it's almost like a firewall where it's de default deny anymore. You just now nah, I'm not paying attention. I'm not paying attention, you know, you have to go out and look for what you want. And that's what basically the concept of permission-based marketing is. It's okay. I'm an organization and I want them to come to me. I'm going to put out content that's valuable for them. 
And then they're going to come in, you know, sign up with an email. And they're going to say, hey, I, I take something valuable away from you that you're providing, I guess, for free. But the company's going to say, hey, look, we now that we have your email, you know, we're going to talk to you about a little more than just what we provide initially with, you know, blog posts, podcasts, content that you enjoy. And we're going to start to say, hey, well, if, if you like this, why don't you check out this that we do or check out what we do with a product? And so it's a lot of the road we're going down. I'd say it's the road we're kind of going down. It's getting away from this interruption marketing where it's paying for advertisements and I guess bugging people because they're opting in. They're opting in. You're not pushing it on them. They're saying, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm on board with you. I hear the same thing repeated by 90% of the statistics and, 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 and conversations around advertising is that, look, most of the traffic that people get are because of word of mouth, right? Because yeah. they've asked their friends for a recommendation, right? Because you're already yeah. having a conversation with them, might as well get their opinion and follow up on that rather than someone trying to, you know, hook you into whatever. Absolutely. And that he brings that up. He says, who's like, who are you more likely to listen to? And it's a stranger or a friend. And you said it exactly. You know, if, if a stranger recommends a movie, you have no idea who that person is or if they're, you know, if their tastes are similar. If a friend says, hey, I enjoyed this movie, you, you kind of know who they are and you're probably going to take their word for it. Yeah, it probably was a good movie. I'm glad you brought that up because he, he brings up that exact point of you're, you're more likely to listen to a friend than a stranger. So I do have this great example that I loved that he brought up for interruption marketing. Um, and it's someone in an airport walks up to you and asks where gate seven is. Obviously, you weren't hoping for or expecting someone to come up and ask this question. But since he looks nice enough, you point him to the right direction. Now imagine the same airport, but it's three in the afternoon and you're late for your flight. You've already been approached five times. Odds are your response will be a lot different. You might ignore them altogether. What if it's the fifth, 10th, 50th, 100th person to do this? Sooner or later, it becomes background noise. Yeah. The great point is that marketers have responded to this problem with the single worst cure possible to deal with the clutter and the diminished effectiveness of interruption marketing. They're interrupting us even more. Essentially, you're solving the problem by throwing more stuff at the problem. <laughs> yeah. What I really liked is you brought up uh, you spend on marketing to get a return back from it. And you see like a 2%, say you see a 2% result or 2% click through on the ad that runs they say okay it worked but we need more we need uh three percent not two percent so you know what they do they run it again but they spend more on it and it's just the cycle of just spending spending more on advertising and putting more out there to get this marginal return the one comedy brings up I, I think this book was written over 20 years ago 99 I I, I I don't have a date on it but it seems like it was uh before i guess I would say big social media stuff such as like Facebook, Twitter. And before this was, that was kind of around in the norm. One of the things he kind of says that I really like is that consumers are spending less time seeking alternative solutions. He brings up that people don't need to care as much as they used to. The quality of products has increased dramatically. 90 years ago, we made more stuff. We didn't buy it. I'm not, can you, can you expand on that? I don't think I'm getting the gist of that. So, the big comment with that was in terms of physical products. The one comment he made was soap, bars of soap, like physical bars of soap. I guess mass manufacturing wasn't, it was around, uh, but you had to, I guess there wasn't great QA. You weren't on your own, but you had to kind of double guess and check everything. It wasn't just, hey, walk up to the shelf and say, all right, I'm using this soap. You know, Now you have FDA and all these regulatory bodies that are just like, hey, yeah, you can't do that. So the big point was that you don't have to worry about it as much. Uh, the quality has dramatically improved. So you're saying that since the, the, the quality of most products has, have gone up, most products have a, a more, not even playing field, but it's it's easier to just choose something and get it over with. Right. It's hard to break in. He's saying, I, mm. I think where he's going with this is it's harder to break in. It's because there's so many other things that just work. I go to the bar of soap example because on the shelf, it's just, you know, you're, you're essentially picking a flavor now. They both have the same function. You're picking, oh, do I want do I want to smell like a coconut or do I want to smell like apples? You know, it's yeah. you don't have to worry about, well, what's in this bar of soap that I'm going to just rub like across my body or whatever. You don't really have to worry about that stuff anymore. So, yeah. And, and you know, to 
to break away from the soap thing, so I just got an SD card reader for my sure. computer, right? Just a little dongle. And yeah. I log into Amazon and I I just pick out the one that has the features I want, <laughs> not necessarily yeah. the one that, you know, is a brand name or whatever. I don't think it was an Amazon Basics one. It was just the one that I found that had the SD card reader and the micro one that I wanted. I was like, right. that's, that's it. That's it. Done. Yeah, no, I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time looking at quality of different things. Right. And you didn't have to – did you look into the company at all? No, and I didn't I didn't check and see, you know, is is it Linux compatible? Is it I just kind of assume that we have these standards in place that everything just kind of works. works, right? I mean, it's in my car right now. I'll have to get it out and to see if it actually works. Yeah. But <laughs> chances are it's going to work just fine. Yeah, right. It plugs in and it, what do you know? It's an SD card reader. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big point that I kind of found interesting that people don't have to worry. I guess this is a problem we never really had to deal with in the 80s, 90s in computing. Maybe you would have to worry about, is this is this SD card compatible with my computer? Well, not only that, but like I, I think that's also lulled us into a false sense of security where we have, you know, the FDA or we have um, oversight committees in, in the federal government or international that that kind of regulate this stuff. But then we're, 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 we're abdicating our responsibility, and as a result, we're – subject to you know kind of kind of this rule where where you get uh favoritism you know or or you have kind of uh results being skewed because you know you're only dealing with one regulatory body you don't have kind of the the market to fall back on to make those decisions for you because the market has abdicated their responsibility to these regulated bodies um so i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure that that's all kinds of good but i think it's 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 where we are right now. So what you know? How how do we address this? Right. And the one thing with the market is that he mentioned, I'm glad you brought that up. Is the uh, market requires two things? It's uh, demand and scarcity. He talked about that. How you, you kind of have to create demand and make it make it kind of a scarce product for that market to exist, essentially. But I, I'm not going to dive into that. That's a whole different economics discussion. Permissive marketing it offers consumer. It offers a consumer an opportunity to volunteer to be marketed to. Uh, it allows the marketers to tell their story more calmly and succinctly without the fear of being interrupted by competitors or interruption marketers. It serves both consumers and marketers in a symbiotic exchange. I, I love this I, because you're not sitting, you're not fighting for attention. They they said, "Hey, we're interested," and you can exchange ideas, thoughts, and products in a calm manner. You're not just throwing it at them or, you know, you know, throwing it at the wall and seeing if it sticks. It's uh, kind of them coming up and saying, hey, I, I want to learn more. And you're saying, OK, well, this is kind of what we do and this is how we offer it and who we offer it for. You know, are you interested and do you want to learn more? And basically, that's the one thing I learned. Give consumers the piece, but don't give them the whole pie and ask them to c keep coming back and keep coming back for seconds. Uh, in the book, he said, fire 70% of your customers and then focus on the 30% that you didn't fire and, and continue to sell them. Because he said a, a lot of uh, current business is just basically you can ask your dedicated and uh, most focused customers, people most interested in your product to keep coming back and asking them if they want more and more. That's the 80-20 rule though, isn't it? Like Pareto's principle? What, what do you mean? Yeah, it's like you know, focus focus on the focus on the twenty percent that are valuable to your company. Absolutely. Well, he said he said thirty percent. Seventy thirty. Yeah, yeah. seventy thirty. Well, he, yeah. yeah. I would I would say he's he's probably approaching the eighty twenty rule because that that's what that sounds like. Like you you have you have twenty yeah. percent of your customers that generate eighty percent of your profits or something like that. Right, and ha that repeat business with the, those twenty mm -hmm. percent of customers. Really, he covered where we're at, where we need to be uh, with permission marketing. So he, went, he covered interruption marketing and how kind of advertisers currently exist, uh, permission marketing. And then he talked about the types of permissions, which I thought were pretty helpful. It's in the title of the book, but it's uh, turning strangers into friends, friends into customers, and customers into, uh, I think you called it, like it, it was a, a fancier word for lifetime customer, but um, basically developing a long-term relationship with um, your customers and kind of getting them to pay for services and everyone's kind of getting value out of the exchange. It's not someone's losing. It's, it's kind of everyone's winning. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't that every kind of marketing pitch though? 
Sure. Yeah. And, and I think it's a marketing book. I, I mean, <laughs> you weren't not going to get that. <laughs> But he says it, it requires patience. It's not something that happens overnight. That, that, I thought that was very important. It's not something that happens overnight. I think everyone can kind of say that. You're probably crazy or an idiot if you just trust anyone you meet in the, on the first day. It, you just met someone. You you have no idea what their background is, who they are. You kind of have to. I, I I walk in with que- you know questioning. You just have to question. Yeah. So building trust isn't something that happens overnight. It takes time. And that's a lot of what permission marketing is based off of. What's your favorite thing about building trust that that the book went over? He he suggested it's cheesy, but it's a uh, kind of like dating your customer. He says the five steps to dating your customer. I, I'll go over. I, ha- I have the five actually right in front of me here. It's uh the five steps to dating your customer. It's offer the prospect an incentive to volunteer. By getting them to volunteer, I think you're. You're getting them involved. It's not just you throwing stuff at them saying, hey, do this, do this, or you sign up for this, or, you know. Yeah, it gets them invested, which is huge. Using the attention offered by the prospect, offer them a curriculum over time, teaching the consumer about the product or service, getting them to volunteer, and then offering them the pieces uh, I really liked, uh, reinforcing the incentive, and then offering more incentives along, along the way. And then leveraging the permission to change the consumer behavior towards profits. So he talked about the trust model a little bit, and he goes through uh, the different types of uh, trust is out there. So obviously, the first one is stranger, sure, whatever. Um, But the last one, which I found very interesting, was you're making decisions on behalf of this person. I don't know if I'd even call it consulting-based or what, but you're essentially making a decision that says, hey, look, you need to spend more money in our products and services because we're going to help you do this or we're going to do this. And you have the actual buying power on behalf of that person. You're taking their resources and you're steering it in the direction they want saying, we're going to make decisions for you. I I just thought was a crazy concept to wrap my head around. Well, at at the, at the end of the time, it's, it's still a relationship too. There's there's obviously give and take, you obviously have to maintain that relationship. Like if you, you you can't just go downhill the, the second you start to, and he met he I'm glad you said that because he mentions that and he said, you know, if you make a wrong decision on that fifth level where you're making decisions for them, that trust is just snapped. Yeah. So you have to make a decision that's I guess has best in mind for everybody. You know, there's yeah. the marketing spiel yeah. again. But yeah. yeah, I really like the book. Uh I put a lot of the, the fourth chapter, I think, is where the most most and the best information is. So I, I see you pulled a lot of quotes here. Uh, anything that you wanted to, to highlight or that, that really stuck out to you? Uh, the random ones. Um, I got one here. It's a single ad is not enough to sell product. So actually something he mentioned is in traditional marketing, I guess on tel- television base, it takes nine times for someone to remember something. But people are only likely to see one in three ads that you run, I guess. I think it was like a one in 27 chance of the, of a person to remember your brand or product. That's them. That's just you forcing on them saying, Hey, you know, we're paying for advertising. We're just cramming it down the throat. One in 27 shot of it working. Um, not only, not only working, but like them remembering your ad at all. Right. Which is an insane number because that's a, that's a 3% chance of working. Yeah, well, it, it working in the sense that you know they they can recognize your ad again. Yeah, that doesn't mean they're going to make a purchase. Even bringing it up to to nowadays speed, I mean, click through rates on any kind of ads right now are in the in the range of like one tenth of a percent to three tenths of a percent. Like it's abysmal. Think about that. So what do you have to run ten thousand to get three? It, three tenths of a percent. Okay, one thousand. But still, yeah. think about that. A thousand ads are a lot, and three people click it. And it's it's weird because you know a lot of the people that we're targeting have ad blockers, right? Right. I mean, we do. Right. Oh, I absolutely run an ad blocker. Yeah. JavaScript, you know, block yeah. JavaScript as well. Yeah. So at at this point, we also we almost have to go the you know edutainment, you know route. Route. Right. Right. Because we 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 need we need definitely more of a recommendation culture and and this isn't just for customers either this is for you know getting getting to users or you know getting people who would uh, contribute 
Yeah, no, nothing else to add. Okay. I would recommend it. Um, some books I don't recommend. I would absolutely recommend this mm. book. As as we wrap up the episode, you know, we're we've we've talked a lot today about you know getting the message out and and community and stuff and uh, with the with the recent announcement of the subreddit, you know, please please go ahead and and go to Reddit, go to the R Compose subreddit, uh, so you can join us in in our ongoing discussions online, right? Where we where we keep this conversation going once the episode's over. Right. We want to make sure to, to keep you updated on all the latest developments on the Arkham Post technology stack. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.